Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the brand new Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. I say brand new because from here on, I'm going to be doing these true scary stories two hours long that will have a variety of genres that everyone loves. Blackwoods, creepy encounters, let's not meet cryptids, skinwalkers, etc., etc. So, we will see how these videos go. If I don't see any interaction and whatnot with this style of video, I'll go back to the old ones. Cool? All right. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows this entire time and you enjoy what you are hearing, please step on up and tickle that subscribe button and make sure to ding the bell and set your notifications to all. That way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you are interested in becoming a member of Back to Ashes or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, that information can be found down below in the description box. You can also find timestamps to this video in the description, letting you know which genre is what. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. After that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. When I was little, my mom always opened up to the front screen door in the summer. It was something she always did as we lived in a rural, mostly safe area. It was old and never locked, almost never shut all the way. The dog always escaped out of it. The room connected to this door was our middle room with the desktop computer in it. One day, I was looking for art supplies in that room. The front door opened to the screen. I remember I was looking for a few minutes. My mom was in the kitchen. I kept looking and looking, turned around to look elsewhere. There was a burly, grisly-looking man standing there. I'd never seen him before. He must have been staring a while. When I saw him, he stayed put, still, silent. No knock, no asking for my mother, no hello. Still, I hadn't heard any crumpling of gravel from a car pulling in. Where did he come from? I ran to the kitchen and told my mom some guy was standing there. She walked out cautiously. I saw and heard her speak briefly through the screen door. Then she shut the front door and locked it. She never talked about it to me, even when I asked questions. And as an adult, she doesn't seem to remember what I remember so vividly at all. I still mull over. Why is he here? Where was this car? Why would he be walking in a rural area with no sidewalks? Why was he silently watching me so close to the door? How long was he there for? What was he planning? Why our house and not the neighbors? I don't know. But I'm glad I turned around when I did. Two nights back, I had an experience with something in the wooded areas around the lake, the Overlook. I tried to do my research on what it could have been. I came across encounters of other cryptids like skinwalkers and wendigos. However, the suburban nature of this encounter has led me to disqualify the possibility of it being either of those creatures, and its appearance and location has led me here. I don't know what it was, but it was something that felt human, but I know it couldn't have been a human. It felt too much like an animal. It still hit me like I was being watched by an animal. It just took longer for me to catch on than I usually do. So, I'm there off the main streets in the southwestern suburbs at the Overlook, listening to music in my car. I often like to get out of the city to clear my head and I feel like I heard something pulling up from behind. You know it's late, it's dark, 
people like to come to the Overlook to drink or find some privacy. So I check out my rear view and I see it in the moonlight. Something is in the shadows across the road up the hill. Unsure of what it is, I move to adjust my mirror to get a better look. When I see eyes, like how animals have eyes that glisten in the dark. It's like that, but they're watching me through the rear view, transfixed, focused, intent, like the way people do in photographs. It looked like what I now imagine is the devil of some kind, tall and white as snow. It froze me in place. It had straightforward eyes like predators do. That's all I got to look at as it was slinked up against and behind the trees. My head, I guess, finally processes what I was seeing and I get hit. Like someone poured ice down my back. That feeling I get when someone is approaching me from behind or something. It's just watching me. This sends me bugging out into panic, so I shift into drive and I hook a right forward and out of the lot back onto the main road, running along the hill, I speed up and head forward. I just drive till I hit the main road with streetlights again and don't stop until I get back out of the surrounding preserves area. The eyes felt so human, but it felt impossible for someone to be out there, but I know it is just... I don't know, it couldn't have been an animal because when I'm out in the preserves, it never felt like that when I was amongst the deer or the other animals that I know are out there. It felt like it was wrong, like it was invading the space, but it didn't feel like a person, a person I know when they are around. I keep my guard up, but whatever it was flew beneath my senses and fed into the dark. I don't know what it was, but it made me feel so sick that I was there, and I missed it. I didn't know until it fully registered. Something was out there with me. I don't know what it was, but if anyone has any idea that could give me any better understanding, please, I'm willing to talk or listen. Was this a possible crawler sighting? My family has lived in Iowa since July of 2017, and we live in a small neighborhood with a minimum of 25 houses, and it is surrounded by a forest. I have seen many horror movies, and most of the movies are usually in a forest, so my paranoia was already alarmed. A year into living in Iowa, our dog was getting really old, so we got another dog so our old dog has a friend. We named our new dog Tucker, and he is a very energetic dog with everyone and everything. Our old dog passed away a couple of months later, and Tucker was the only interactive pet we have. A couple of years later, my mom and dad got divorced, and she moved on to a guy that lives a couple of miles from our house. My mom and dad settled on a schedule on what day they can spend the day with us, while the other goes somewhere else for a couple of days. For context, my mom's side is native. I forgot what tribe we are. And we do believe in the whole lore of skinwalkers and wendigos. On one of my mom's days, she drives up this road where it's surrounded by a bunch of trees and a couple of houses and two farms. There is a hill on this road that she has to drive up. And as my mom drove up the hill, she saw something in a field near the neighborhood. What she saw was tall, gray-skinned, had dare hooves as feet, and it was walking into the woods. My mom was confused, and when she reached the stop sign, she looked back in her mirror, and nothing. Now my mom was scared because she remembered all the stories of the Wendigo and drove off to our house. When she told me this, I was already scared because of the stories I've heard on YouTube. As she told the story, I remembered the skinwalker, mostly all those stories of the encounters I've found on YouTube. 
After this, I was extremely cautious when I was outside on my bike rides. Without thinking, I rode my bike near the hill where my mom saw the possible Wendigo. I brought my camera to take pictures of the landscape because it was nice out. But my paranoia was going off when I was near the field, and I always trust my paranoia. As I rode off, I felt like I was being watched when I rode past the field. A couple of days later, it was night, and my dog had to go outside to go to the bathroom. I put my dog on his leash that is connected to the porch and let Tucker out. I turned on the light so I could see what Tucker was doing. Tucker is barking at something in the dark. I opened the back door and told Tucker to stop barking and get inside because his business was done and his barking would wake up the neighbors. After telling him to get inside, he kept barking at something in the darkness. My paranoia kicked in and I shouted out for him to get inside, but he kept barking. I started to get really scared and I finally looked into the darkness to see nothing but eyes shining from the porch light. As I saw those eyes, an instinct kicked in to pull on the leash and scream out, Get inside! Finally, Tucker responds by reacting to the pull of the leash and running towards the door. I slammed the door as soon as Tucker ran inside. I shut the porch light off and took the leash off its collar, locked every single door and window in the house, and covered every window and anything that you can look through. After Tucker was off his leash, he ran downstairs into our basement. So, I grabbed my food and went downstairs to keep an eye on my dog. It's been two months since then, and my routine when it got dark was what I did when I saw those eyes outside. Like, close the blinds, lock the doors, and turn off the lights from outside. Now when I'm outside, I need a group of people or at least a weapon on me. I've never only started thinking about this in the last 10 to 15 years, but I think I nearly escaped being raped and or murdered as a kid. When I was a preteen growing up in rural Texas, a family from Las Vegas moved next to us. It was Harry, that was his real name, and his wife, her mother, two daughters, and one of their husbands. I was drawn to them because they were very friendly and interesting all except Harry. It didn't take long to figure out that everyone in the family hated him. He gave off a real dirtbag vibe. The family had money, but it came from his wife's side of the family. He didn't really fit in with the rest of them. Over a year or so, I spent more and more time over there, but avoided Harry like the plague. Talking to his stepdaughters, I learned that their mother was getting ready to divorce him. I think he could see the writing on the wall, too. One day, out of the blue, he stopped over at my house. I was outside, riding my bike or something. He asked if I wanted to take a ride with him to check on their cattle. For some stupid reason, I forgot all of my misgivings about him. I thought it might be cool to take a ride with him out in the country to check out the livestock. My mom was inside talking to a friend on the phone. I'll never forget how she reacted when I asked her if I could go with them. Without interrupting her conversation, she mouthed the word, no, and shook her head to reiterate the point. She told me to just go to the front door and shake my head, rather than going outside and telling him that I wasn't going. Harry just shrugged and left. After his wife finally kicked him out, Harry started harassing them in weird ways, creeping outside their house at night, and even calling in fake obituaries from one of the daughters into the local newspaper. Thankfully, he took back off to Vegas soon after. After I had kids of my own, I started thinking about that incident and what could have happened to me that day if my mom hadn't had the foresight to tell me I couldn't go. I think Harry would have hurt me just to get back at his family members who had a fondness for me. It's chilling to think about, 
even still to this day. From when I was about 11 to 14 years old, I had a best friend named Spencer. Spencer had a decent sized family and very big house. We hung out practically nonstop outside of school. He was homeschooled and I was in public school. During the summer, I practically lived at their house. Spencer had an older brother named Keenan. Keenan was about five years older than him and I, and I thought he hung the moon. He was just so cool. He listened to great music and played guitar, and I always wanted to be around him. One summer, when I was 13, Keenan went to summer camp. He was supposed to visit the Grand Canyon and go kayaking and do a ton of other fun stuff. We were super jealous. It was weird not having him around all the time since I basically stayed at their house the entire summer. Finally, the day came where Spencer's dad was supposed to go to the airport to pick up Keenan. We were super stoked to hear all about camp. His dad drove up and we ran downstairs to greet them. And yet, we didn't see Keenan. His dad had tears running down his face, and he exclaimed, He didn't make it. He didn't make it, you guys. My heart dropped into my stomach, and I started to panic. Keenan walked up right behind him, and they both started laughing. It was a huge dick move. Anyways, we helped him unload his luggage and stayed up until midnight talking about his summer. He had so much to say. He said he had the time of his life and told us all about how he almost went overboard while whitewater rafting and how he surely would have drowned if he did. As two 13-year-old boys, we were enamored by Keenan and everything he did. We talked about how Spencer and I were going to go to the same camp once we turned 18. It had been a long day and it was time for all of us to go to bed. Keenan told us he would tell us more in the morning when he woke up. I had fallen asleep and awoken in a cold sweat because of a nightmare I had. In my dream, Spencer and I went about our entire day that day, just as we had before, except when their dad showed up and joked about Keenan dying on his trip, he actually did die. This was practically my idol. The dream was so vivid. I needed to go and get some water just to calm myself down afterwards. I checked my phone before I headed to the kitchen, and it was 3.30 a.m. The house was so dark, and I had to tiptoe to be quiet and make sure not to wake anyone up. As I walk through the den on my way to the kitchen, I see the moonlight spilling into the living room, the only light in the house. I see what I think is a large silhouette, and as I get closer and my eyes adjust, I see Keenan hanging from the ceiling fan. I freak out and run across the room in a dead sprint and turn the light on to see if my eyes were deceiving me. It was him, except he was asleep and standing in the middle of the room underneath the fan with one of his arms raised straight up over his head. I never knew Keenan in a sleepwalk before and luckily he snapped out of it before I tried to wake him up. He looked at me super confused, looked around and noticed where he was and said, Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you guys. I guess I developed a bit of a sleepwalking habit at camp. Hello. I would first like to start this off with a small disclaimer. The names in this story have been changed to protect identities. However, the location is accurate. Let's begin. This story takes place on the shores of Lake Simcoe, Ontario, Canada, in a small town named Brecon, a town with a population of over 800. This is very much your typical small countryside town with not much to it other than fields upon fields a small grocery store, post office, and a small restaurant. A short drive through this town going north on Highway 12 is where my aunt and uncle lives, 
especially the east side of the highway, which is as specific as I like to get. Growing up, I always looked forward to going up there. It took approximately an hour and a half to drive there, which was also something I enjoyed as well. Before I dive too much into this story, I'd like to state that I was never really one to believe in supernatural or paranormal. However, after I was witness to the events I will get into, that would change. I would also like to state that I have no intentions of trying to convince those who listen to my story. It was October of 2015, and my girlfriend at the time and I, along with some of my family, made the drive up to my aunt's for the night to have dinner. We arrived late in the afternoon, and after greeting my aunt and uncle, I quickly began to set up the tent I brought along to sleep in, as there were more people at the house now than there is available sleeping space. So I offered to sleep outside in the tent with my girlfriend. Fast forward a few hours and we have now finished our dinner and are gathered outside on the sheltered porch, enjoying a few laughs in each other's company. A bit more time has passed and now the sun has set. My girlfriend excuses herself to go inside and use the washroom, which is in the basement. She knows where it is and despite me offering to take her inside, she declines and goes in on her own. Shortly thereafter, she returns, but with a look of concern on her face. Now, having rejoined everyone on the porch, she quietly pulls me aside. Having heard the fear in her voice, I quickly excused both of us. I go on to ask her what the matter was, clearly seeing something has startled her. She went on to explain that on her way downstairs to the washroom, she passed the den, which has an old reclining rocking chair in it. As she walked through, now having just passed the den in that chair, she believed she heard a noise, and after looking around, she noticed the chair was now moving slightly, and rising from behind the chair was two red lights, the size of eyes, which stopped at about six feet high. Needless to say, she never made it to the washroom, instead turned around and got out of there as quickly as she could. After she explained this, I tried my best to calm her down and reassure her that it was likely just the cat jumping off the chair, and maybe the red lights were something coming in the window from outside. She did calm down. However, I could tell she didn't buy what I was saying for one second. And in all honesty, I'm not sure I really bought it myself either. I have always felt something odd while at this house, but I was always chalking it up to just being a nervous kid in a house that wasn't my own. We joined back with my family and tried to enjoy the last bit of the night before heading off to the tent to go to bed. Having seen to have forgotten a small event that took place in the basement earlier, we said our goodnight and take off to bed. The cool October air had us sleeping in no time. A few hours have passed and I'm awoken. I have a hard time sleeping straight through the night, and waking up several times at night isn't uncommon for me. I rub my eyes and take a look over to my girlfriend, who is still fast asleep. I throw my shoes on, and I make my way to the house to grab a glass of water. After getting to the house, then the kitchen, I now have my drink. From the kitchen, I can see headlights coming up the country road, getting to the end of the laneway, which is probably... 50 yards or so, then just sitting there for a few seconds before proceeding to drive up the laneway. It's my cousin, who was expected home earlier in the night, but ended up working late. I finish my drink and make my way back out of the house with the intentions to meet her outside and chat for a minute before heading back to bed. As I approach the door leading outside, I am almost knocked on my back from her rushing in the house swinging the door open violently. I ask her what's wrong, and I was not met with a verbal response. Instead, she raised her finger, pointing at the door. Instinctively, I looked. There were two red lights the size of eyes, inches away from the glass on the door, accompanied by fog forming on the glass, then disappearing as if someone was standing nose to the glass breathing. My cousin told me that upon driving down the road towards the house, 
she was hit with a heavy sense of dread and anxiety. Once getting to the end of the laneway, she claims to have seen a tall, dark shadow standing beside the house, which explained why she had stopped and what she was looking at. The feeling of dread and fear quickly took over, prompting her to make a run to the house as soon as she got out of her car. We talked for a few more minutes before I got the courage to make the walk back to my tent. After quickly walking across the large yard, I practically dive into the tent, not exactly concerned about waking up my girlfriend, as I felt she would be understanding. All things considered. I enter the tent, heart racing, and I zip the door to the tent after taking a quick look outside, fully expecting to see something, anything, face to face with me. But nothing. I let out a small sigh of relief, zip up the tent, and turned around, now facing my bed, and more importantly, my girlfriend, who was sitting straight up. I can't make out any features, but I get in bed beside her under the covers and apologizing for waking her up. The words that came out of her mouth next, I truly believe will stay with me until the day I die. I apologize, and there is a short pause before she says, I almost had her. I will get her next time. I sat there, completely still, not making a sound. I have always heard how fear could be paralyzing, but I always thought that just happened in movies. I learned that night that I was wrong. I reached over and grabbed my phone to use as a light. I made up the nerve to now face my girlfriend, who is now far from visible and I can see her eyes are shut. She appears to be sleeping, but still sitting upright and not moving. I thought about what I should do and realized there wasn't much I could do. I guided her to lay back down and I attempted to get some sleep, but as I'm sure many of you hearing this would expect, sleep never happened. The morning came and a wave of relief came over me. My girlfriend woke up, and I decided I wasn't going to bring up anything that happened after she fell asleep. I didn't want to freak her out, especially because we were planning on staying over again that night. That would not happen. The day goes on like a regular day, and we are all back together sharing laughs and each other's company. My cousin has not left her room, but nobody was very surprised considering... We all knew she gets home quite late and would be working again tonight. So really, this was her time to sleep. As the day goes on, my aunt receives a call from her neighbor. Now, her neighbor lived close to a kilometer away, but was her neighbor nonetheless. After a quick phone call, my aunt returned saying her neighbor and her neighbor's friend would be joining us for dinner tonight. The two of them arrive at around four. My cousin, who has only been awake for a short period of time, has gotten ready for work and upon passing my aunt and uncle, says she needs to talk to them later, everyone hearing the concern in her voice. I'm unsure if it was the statement that prompted my girlfriend to bring up what she witnessed the day prior, but she did. After sharing what she saw, the neighbor's friend became quite interested, not obviously worried or anything, but the neighbor's friend, who we can call Jill, said that she has experienced similar things her whole life. Jane went on to share some of her own similar personal stories before nervously asking us if it would be okay if she, alone, walked through the house, claiming sometimes she can pick up on things. We have all since eaten dinner and agreed to let her take her own personal tour of the house alone. We are gathered out in the yard, circling the fire pit and watching through the windows of the house, and as she enters room by room, turning off the light before entering the next room. Soon, the house is dark, and we see her make her way towards the basement. Far more time was spent down there than the main floor of the house. She returns and joins us outside. Well, we ask, not exactly sure what to expect. She looked around the group, visibly nervous before recounting her time at the house 
through the entire day. Jane started off by stating she first saw something, a tall, dark shadow inside the house as they were approaching the house when they first got here. She went on to say she had seen it numerous times throughout the day. It wasn't until my girlfriend recounted what she had seen that made her decide to walk through the house alone. On her tour through the house, she claimed she saw nothing on the main floor. However, the basement was different. What she said next has baffled me and left me horrified. Take it as you will. She claims to have seen and spoken to an old man in the basement. She claims that he believes my cousin is his wife. She goes on to say that this old man lives in the house and spends most of his time in the basement. The hardest part about listening to all of this is what she says next. With a bit of hesitation, she says he was at a level of peace, but now he is angry, furious, because she was in the house. She could see him. Now we all know about him. He is extremely mad because now we are aware of him. Now, Jane said he isn't peaceful. We ended up packing our belongings and leaving that night, not even giving a second thought to spend another night there. For the next few months, everyone that spent the night in the house would report seeing the red eyes and would have horrible dreams about something lifting them out of their bed before carrying them off into the field. A blessing would later be done on the house, and I haven't heard of anything else occurring. And that's where this story will end. Hopefully, whatever was there is no longer. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you taking your time out to listen. I would like to say again, this is 100% true and not exaggerated. If by some small chance you happen to be from or live in Brecon, you may know the property and my family and will understand this story completely. Hello, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Brad. I am 57 years, born and raised in Ontario, Canada. For me, being in the outdoors has always been where I felt most at home. Whether it be fishing, hunting, or camping, or just a relaxing walk through nature, I was just happy to be outdoors. Living in the greater Toronto area, I often find myself having to drive some distance before I truly feel I am away from everyone else and begin to feel myself immersed in nature. On this particular day, I would find myself making the three-hour drive north to one of Canada's, or at least Ontario's, most well-known provincial parks, Algonquin Park, covering a massive 7,630 kilometers, or depending where you're reading this from, 2,946 kilometers. One can imagine this vast landscape, playing host to several lakes and more trees imaginable. Finding a secluded and quiet place to set up camp is not much of a challenge, which is exactly what I had set out to do on this day. Dawn breaks and I quickly grab any last minute things that I may have forgotten while packing the night previous. Confident I have all the things necessary, I start my car and I am on my way. After a few typical pit stops on the way, I found myself arriving at that park at around 10 a.m. I park my car and begin the long journey to locate my backcountry site. After approximately a five-hour hike, I have successfully navigated the challenging terrain and have reached where I'll be setting up camp. With no sights or sounds of other people, this is exactly what I was looking for. After taking a quiet moment to appreciate the landscape and the view I was witness to, I began setting up my tent, which took no time at all. The sun is setting, and I am settling in, a nice warm fire burning with my dinner cooking over it. I lean back in the chair, once again taking a moment to appreciate where I am, and that's when something catches my eye. Instantly, my attention is drawn to the tree line of my camp, 
perhaps fifty feet or so away. With the sun having all but set, I can't make out what I had seen, or at least what I think I saw. I don't waste much time focusing on it, as I figured my eyes must be playing tricks on me. After all, it's been an incredibly long day, and I am quite tired. Twenty minutes or so pass, and that's when he spoke for the first time. Standing off behind the tree line, right there I thought I'd seen movement before. A man calls out to ask a relatively innocent question. Have you seen my dog? The man calls out, taken entirely off guard by this, figuring I am hours away from where the nearest person should be, as where I am is not considered a well-visited section of the park. I take a moment before responding. I I'm sorry, but I haven't seen any dog, I reply, still behind the coverage of trees and hidden in the darkness that is forming. I can hear more movement. Tracking along the tree line, he is slowly making his way closer. In almost a joking-like tone, the question is repeated. <laughs> Have you seen my dog? Again, with perhaps a little more confidence in my voice, I reply again. Uh, no, I haven't seen your dog. To this, I got no response back, and I don't hear any more movement. A bit confused, I take a sip of my beer before thinking a bit more about this. It's not like it would be uncommon for a dog to escape his owner by accident, but why is this man keeping to the trees? Why did he ask the same question right after I just previously answered him? Why didn't he acknowledge my response and thank me, stating perhaps he would continue to look elsewhere? Little time was spent thinking about all of that before the realization set in that I never actually heard this man walk away. Standing where he was, in thick brush on no clear trail, sounds of him maneuvering through the woods would have been something I took notice of. Yet, nothing. I tell myself that maybe it was just a guy that had a few too many beers or perhaps a guy trying to play a prank on me. Perhaps it truly was a guy out there looking for his dog and I simply don't hear him leave. The thought and questions of this subsides and my attention is grabbed by the open, clear night sky. It's amazing just how bright the stars are when they're not polluted by the lights of a busy city. It's also amazing just how alone it can make one feel. Some time has passed and having completely forgot about my strange encounter with the man earlier, my body has begun to tell me it was time for bed, and with the fire giving off its last flicker, I made my way to my tent. After climbing in, I quickly zipped the tent to ensure no bugs got in, got into my pajamas before getting into my sleeping bag. In total darkness now, the slight glow of the embers in the fire pit is the only thing really visible. The moment my head hits the pillow, I'm out cold. I'm awoken, what I was assuming a couple of hours later, being before the days off, cell phones and not having a watch to tell time, I wasn't sure exactly what the hour was. However, still total darkness now, the embers glow now. Oh. Being before the days off, cell phones and not having a watch to tell time, I wasn't sure exactly what the hour was. However, Still total darkness now, the embers glow now being long gone. I roll over in an attempt to get comfortable again on the hard forest ground. And that's when I hear it. The crunching of leaves and snapping of branches. Instantly, I'm reminded of the man from before. It has to be him, I thought to myself. Tired and half awake, I lay there unsure of what to do. Maybe it's just an animal. After all, look where I am. Surely a raccoon or bear, deer, or whatever wildlife walking around the camp is much more likely than the man from before. I quickly thought to myself afterwards. A moment passes, and I'm about to shut my eyes, when from approximately 50 yards away, I hear one last twig snap, followed by the sound of something 
or someone, moving towards my tent at full speed. Listening, I can only hear how much ground they're covering and how close they must be getting, whatever it is. The sounds come to a stop at my fire pit, only a few feet from my tent. My heart now racing, I listen in total fear. Before I had a moment to compose myself, I hear it slowly begin getting closer and closer to my tent, until I swear I can hear this thing breathing. Now circling my tent, it comes to a stop at the door to my tent. Frozen in fear, my body allows me to do nothing but just lay there, totally still. I don't dare make a noise. Tapping is what I begin to hear on the door of the tent, in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. Tapping, and the all too familiar voice asking now in a whisper, You don't have my dog, do you? This is what confirmed that. Despite me having much preferred this to be a wild animal of some sort, it wasn't. It was the man from before. A feeling of nausea overtakes me as I battle with the realization that he likely never did leave earlier and has likely been watching me all night. Still being paralyzed in fear, he speaks again. I know you're awake in there. His emotionless voice makes it all the more unsettling. I'm unsure if it was the fight-or-flight instincts kicking in, but I get the courage, now with absolutely no confidence in my voice, to yell out at him. You need to leave, now. I have my hunting rifle, and I will protect myself if I have to. I shout out at him. A hunting rifle is not something I had. However, I was praying he didn't know that. My demand was met with more unsettling laughter. Following this, I do actually hear him leaving, eventually, losing the sound altogether. Slowly, I feel my body release from the grips of terror. I have a decision to make, I think to myself. Not feeling confident that I have seen the last of this man, who clearly at this point does not mean well, I tangle with the idea of packing up as much stuff as I quickly can and leaving right there and then or sticking it out until morning with sleep likely not happening. With adrenaline coursing through my veins like gas through a race machine, I make my decision. I'm leaving tonight. Right now. I quickly pack my backpack with whatever I can grab in the tent, and I make the decision that I'll abandon my tent, as it'll take too long to take down and pack up. If I'm going to leave right now, I want to take this guy by surprise and taking the time to gather my tent would only eliminate that element. My backpack now ready, I take a deep breath and unzip my tent, instantly breaking out into a full-blown sprint. I turn my headlamp on, which I previously put on before exiting my tent, quickly picking up the markers for the trail. Figuring I can certainly shave off some time of what took me five hours before to get here. I understand that it'll still be hours before I reach my car. The sun also not due to rise for quite some time yet. I'm a fairly fit guy, and despite my aging body, I was making good time. Constantly looking back over my shoulder, fully expecting to see someone in pursuit of me. But I don't. My sprint had turned into a jog, which, after an hour or so, turns into a walk. Exhausted from my first day, little sleep, now this. I take a second to catch my breath, feeling confident I have put some distance between us, and sure if he even was following me. I turn off my headlamp with the hopes of hiding my location, if in fact I was being followed, and took a knee. After a brief moment, I get to my feet and click my headlamp back on and prepare to start running again, hoping to not stop anymore. Almost on cue with the click of my headlamp, I hear, not too far off in the distance, a question that was different from those asked prior. A question that, quite honestly, shook me to my core. Are you sure you don't have my car keys? 
ask in a tone like this was some sort of sick, twisted game. Before I have a chance to answer, I hear a familiar sound of keys jingling. Instantly, I know those are my keys. I had forgotten them out in the pocket of my chair by the fire. I waste no time actually checking to ensure if this revelation is true. I break back out into a sprint, headlamp on, illuminating the forest as the beam points straight. I see a sign up ahead. Park Ranger Station, one kilometer, it read, with an arrow pointing in the direction of the mentioned station. Without a thought, I change my course and head for that station, knowing that it would be a far off shorter distance to the ranger station than it is to my car, which I apparently don't have keys for now anyways. As I make it through the woods, the trail begins to open up, and for the first time in what feels like forever, the feeling of hope takes me as I can now make out the building of the ranger station, dimly lit by a single light just above the front door. My legs now feeling like concrete. I take my last few seconds before practically falling through the door, which luckily was unlocked. The look of surprise on two rangers' faces is what I was met with as I swiftly slammed the door behind me. After explaining my story, authorities were quickly notified. Fast forward a couple of hours, as I am still very much in the middle of nowhere, and police being a bit of a drive from the park itself, and a small team of officers arrive to take my story and information. The realization sets in that we likely won't be finding this man tonight, as it is still pitch black. I leave with the officers. I arrive back to the park's main entrance, where a building stands, acting as reception, checking people in, providing information to visitors, etc. This is where I was able to make a phone call, waking up a good friend who, after hearing my story, agreed to come pick me up, as I could not drive without my keys. My friend arrives and the police tell me they would be in touch if any information is discovered about this now active police investigation. I thanked him and we began the drive home. The following day, I am driven back up to the park, now with my spare key. Upon getting to the park, I notice no presence of police, officers, or cruisers. I try to comfort myself and suggest that maybe they're all off in the forest, by my sight, with the rangers who know the park perhaps. That thought seemed to ease my mind, now driving myself back home in my own car. A few months have passed and I never have heard anything from the authorities. Nothing on the news, nothing in the paper like I was sort of expecting. To me, this was a huge deal. I'm confident my life was on the line that night, and I still wonder what would have happened if that man caught up to me, or if I fell and broke my leg. To the police, perhaps they just chalked it up to some guy who had a few too many beers or someone playing a prank. Regardless, that guy was never caught. Or, if he was, I wasn't notified, as I was told I would be. So, if you find yourself considering this park as a relaxing destination for you, make sure you take in all of its beauty, the tranquility of it, the amazing clean lakes it has to offer. But, just remember, you might not be alone out there. And, if a man asks if you've seen his dog, Waste no time. You need to run. When we lived in New Orleans, we had a nice little two-bedroom apartment. Just my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and I living together for over four years. The apartment was nice and spacious and came at a great price. We felt really lucky. I guess it's relevant to mention that my wife works weekends sometimes and I don't. That means sometimes I get to hang out all day by myself. That particular morning, I woke up early. Like, really early. Like, 5.30 a.m. early. It was a Sunday, 
and to no avail, my girlfriend wasn't in the mood for my shenanigans. So, I resigned myself to make some coffee and sit on my computer, lazily browsing the internet. It wasn't notable the first time, so I don't remember when I actually saw it, but in our little office space, there was a closet. This was full of art supplies for my wife and cleaning supplies for me. The thing I noticed was that it was a jar. Just a little bit, the smallest of cracks. I pushed the door closed without thinking twice and went to crack some eggs. Breakfast drew my wife out of her slumber, and as she ate, I left the dishes to soak and wandered back over to the bedroom and turned on the TV. She yelled bye on her way out, and it wasn't long until I was alone. I was barely watching TV and scrolling through my phone. I didn't remember falling asleep, but I must have. Dreaming of something chasing me, usually zombies or some variation. Something about the psychology of your friends and loved ones betraying you and becoming a threat always shook me to my core. My eyes snapped open and I thought I heard footsteps. I looked around and saw nothing. The clock said 9 a.m. She wouldn't be back this early. Maybe it was just part of the dream. I sat back and tried to play some video games on the computer, but nothing really scratched the itch I had. I glanced over and saw that the door to the closet was open again. Just a crack. Just large enough for someone to see through. I thought this to myself and gave myself goosebumps. Then shook my head. Nah, I'm not interesting enough for someone to hide in a closet. I opened the closet door to confirm my feelings. Nothing but a tray of paints that had gotten stale because someone forgot to put the caps back on them, and a full-blown vacuum that someone forgot to empty. I blamed both on my girlfriend and closed the door, closing it tightly and even giving it a slight tug just to make sure. I walked back to the master bedroom to shower, and looking over, I saw the spare room closet door open. Just a crack. Just a small hair open. I had the stomach drop panic moments, and tried to shake it off. Again, who was going to hide in my little ass apartment? I walked over with the confidence of a high school jock in a 90s slasher, opened the door to the closet and met with nothing but Christmas decorations and my interview suit. There wasn't enough room to even hide in the closet if you wanted to. I closed the door, the same as the other closet, tugging on the knob to make sure it was tightly closed. I then began to imagine what I would actually do if someone was in there. The answer is probably shut the bed and run. Then, continuing normally from there, I made lunch, played online with friends, and just loafed around the apartment. My girlfriend came home, and we made dinner together. As we were getting ready for bed, I remember the silly things happening this morning, and looked over to see the spare room closet door open. Just a little bit. Just enough to watch someone from. I knew I closed it. I knew it just didn't blow open on its own. I walked up and closed the door, expecting something, but found nothing again. I pushed the suit back and rooted around, looking for some reason. Am I going crazy? I thought about saying something to my girlfriend, but I didn't. Every time I walked by that room, I checked and the door was latch closed. It never opened. The other closet remained closed, too. I checked other parts of the apartment, cabinets in the kitchen, spare bathtub, and master closet. Anywhere a person might hide. I never found anyone. I didn't sleep well that night and woke up at the tiniest noise. Every time I checked. Nothing. Doors were firmly closed. I finally found some peace and slept. That morning I woke up and found the front door was open. Just a little bit. Just a crack just enough for someone to look in and see us. We moved across the country. We have a house now, and to my demand, cameras cover all of the entrances. I'm certain someone was in my apartment, but I can't prove it. My wife thinks I'm just paranoid 
and watch too many movies, but I know someone was opening doors. Please skip this part if you want to keep the mystery. I actually found out my wife, whom I had lived with for four plus years, likes doors to be open because she thinks the closets smell stale when they're closed. She had been opening closet doors for years on me. I just hadn't noticed until I was home alone and a little paranoid. If you notice, each open door lines up with the time she was home. And to this day, I find closet doors that shouldn't be open. Not lying about the cameras. Those are the only way I feel comfortable knowing it's just her opening doors in my house. The front door was open that morning. It was probably just that. We forgot to lock it, and it blew open. Right? Right? This happened many years ago. I think I was 12 at the time. I grew up in a nice neighborhood, in a old two-story Victorian-style house. We lived in the foothills of the Santa Cruz Mountains on a corner of a quiet street. It was a cool area to grow up in, lots of nature to explore, and few fences to stop kids and their dogs from exploring it. I'm the oldest of four, but at this time, my parents didn't think I was old enough to stay at home, taking care of them by myself for a night. So, they hired a babysitter to watch us. I had a huge crush on her. She was 17 and gorgeous, so I was okay with the deal. It was just a normal summer night, warm and with a big bright moon. It was late, probably around 11 p.m. My brother and sisters had gone to bed. I was up reading and the babysitter was watching TV downstairs. Me and my little brother shared a big room on the second floor that looked out over the front yard. I was reading in my bed when suddenly my brother, in a frightened tight voice, called my name. I thought he was dreaming, but then he stood, bolt upright in bed, and stared out the window. This obviously freaked me the fuck out, so I ran over to him. My brother then pointed out what he was looking at and asked me, Who is that man? Down in the front yard, about 20 yards away, was a lanky, long-haired man looking up into the sky. His arms were outstretched, and he was slowly spinning. Then he started moaning. I immediately started to panic. This was how some of those horror movies start. I jumped up and ran out into the hallway, for once glad that my parents had not put me in charge. Waiting for me in the hallway were my sisters, who had been woken up by the noise outside, and the babysitter came tearing up the stairs, wide-eyed. Now I was really scared. Nobody knew what to do, and the sitter wasn't offering up any ideas. For some reason, I decided to call our neighbor across the street. He was a true curmudgeon, but he knew us. I guess I figured he wouldn't be scared. I grabbed the phone. No cell phones or even cordless ones back then. He answered after a few rings, and I asked him if he could see anyone out front. We saw him on the front lawn, which he had a clear view of from his house. He was obviously annoyed, but he did go look. A couple minutes later, he returned to the phone and told me there was nothing and I needed to go back to bed. Click. We were in no state to do that. I quickly returned to my brother's window and looked again. Big moon flooding the lawn with light. No man. We tried to listen for the moaning. Nothing but the symphony of crickets. The sitter was not going back downstairs alone, and nobody else was going to sleep anytime soon. We all agreed we should go down together and make sure all the doors and windows were locked. We crept downstairs and quickly broke into two groups to check all the doors. I was with a sitter to check the front to my siblings the back of the house. All went well. Locks were secured. No weirdos barging in the house. But the sitter wanted me to look outside one more time. I was still fucking scared. 
conjuring up way too many Friday the 13th and Halloween scenes in my head that my friends and I covertly watched on their cable during sleepovers. But I didn't want to show it in front of the woman of my dreams. Just one more look, and maybe, just maybe, I'd get to be in something like that Revenge of the Nerds movie I also wasn't supposed to watch. So, I quietly moved to the front window, which faced the front steps to our front door. I craned my neck to look out towards the driveway and back towards the lawn where we had seen him before. Nothing. And then suddenly, he was there, running full speed at the window. Half his face was gone, a mess of blood and torn flesh. He has blood all down his shirt and on his shorts. The sitter screamed and I dropped to the floor in the most unmanly way possible. My siblings were crying in the hallway. He started pounding on the front door and yelled incoherently. I remember him saying at some point to, Let me in, please. Even though that seemed extremely polite for a mass murderer, there was no fucking way I was going to acquiesce to that request. Besides, I was frozen in fear on the floor. The most I could muster in a squeaky little boy voice was, Sir? Sir? We can't help you. Please go away. At least I did something. Our protector, the sitter, was long gone. He pounded on the door some more, gave a disappointed and helpless final yelp, and staggered off into the night. I just laid there for a little while. After that, my siblings ran upstairs and huddled together. Soon after, 20 minutes or so, we saw lights and sirens. The sitter had done the same thing in her flight into the bowels of her home and did the one thing that had never occurred to the rest of us. Call 911. They found the bloody man wandering down the street and our nightmare was over. Turned out, he was a cyclist that went out for a full moon ride on a beautiful summer night. But he didn't see the storm ditch on our corner when he took a tight turn at high speed. He slid on his face for at least 20 feet. He eventually came to, but he was so delirious from his injuries and the shock that he was off his rocker. He had been wandering around for a while before any of us knew where he was. We found blood trails crisscrossing the front of the property the next morning. I still feel bad I didn't help him, but I was just a scared kid. My parents didn't go out without us for a while. For years, I was traumatized coming home at night, and nothing ever came of my infatuation. I don't think I ever saw her again, but my brother still loves to mimic what I said that night. Little bastard. Wednesday, June 19th at around 1 to 2 a.m., these are estimated times. This night confuses and scares me every time I think about it. I could remember everything that happened crystal clear. 1.30 a.m., I was going to sleep after watching a show on my iPad. I could remember I couldn't sleep for 15 minutes. And at 1.50 a.m. was when it all happened. I was actually making progress and sleeping when suddenly I felt a change. I couldn't move, and I had extreme trouble breathing. It was like my body was purposefully trying to kill itself. The same experience went on to repeat for six more times until it was 2.30, where it scared me the most. This time it wasn't normal, of course. I still couldn't move or breathe well, but I noticed something else. I was having hallucinations, sound, images, you name it. I had heard knocking, footsteps, and someone mumbling in the background. Everyone in the house was asleep. On my seventh attempt of sleeping caused me to stay up until six in the morning because of how scared I was to go back to sleep. What happened, you might ask? I'm really sure I was asleep for ten minutes, and during those ten minutes, I had a dream or hallucination. I wasn't sure because it felt so real. 
I remember that I woke up. I heard one of my parents charging towards me in my sister's rooms, and no surprises. My door opened. After ten seconds, that's when I tried to move again and saw that my door wasn't opened at all. And I also noticed that when I tried to speak, I couldn't because it was like I was on mute. I realized that this isn't just sleep paralysis, and I immediately went to my parents' room, and I saw that they were sleeping, and that the hallucination I had earlier of one of my parents opening my door was in fact a hallucination. I woke my parents up and told them everything that had happened. They claimed it was just a sleep paralysis moment, but it wasn't. I tried to explain, but I just went back to my room after they comforted me. It is currently 2.53 as I'm writing this horror of a story. I'm too scared to go to sleep and I'm genuinely traumatized. Some things I noticed. I realized that every time I attempted to sleep, it was getting scarier and scarier each time. The first time, noticed I couldn't move and snapped out of it pretty quickly. The second time, same thing as the first time. Third time, I was confused and annoyed this time because I was thinking when the sleep paralysis was going to go away, but weirdly this time was harder to move and gain consciousness. The fourth time, this time was the first time I had experienced the hallucinations. I heard banging, knocking, and mumbling. The fifth time, still the same hallucinations and effects. The sixth time, this hallucination had images. I think I was dreaming because I remember I went downstairs and my mom caught me. That's when... The seventh time, last time I tried to sleep for the night, I gained consciousness and heard the very same footsteps getting louder and louder, like someone was charging towards my room. It was weird because when I hallucinated that my door opened, I could actually sense someone in my room. I felt their presence. After eight or ten seconds, I could no longer feel their presence. I didn't hear my door close, and when I tried to move, it was my hardest attempt yet. It was like a waterfall's force crushing down on me, and I couldn't move no matter how hard I tried. When I eventually did move, I found it shocking that my door was never opened, and when I went to my parents' room to tell them what had happened, I found them asleep. Everything I said so far broken down. Hallucinations and effects. Banging. Knocking. Footsteps. Mumbling in background. Numbness when I try to move my body. Imagine if you were sleeping on your arm for two hours and all the blood flow is on the top section of your arm. That's what the numbness felt like. Extreme trouble breathing. Felt like I just ran a whole 20 miles. Couldn't speak. It was like I was on mute. If you want to know exactly what it feels like, inhale with your mouth and exhale every little bit of air and try to scream. Thirst. Couldn't open my eyes was weird because it seemed like my entire body was paralyzed or something. One to seven attempts. I realized every time that I attempted to sleep, the effects and hallucinations were getting scarier and I felt more and more anxious and annoyed over time until all I felt was fear and confusion. Images or hallucinations, I guess. On my sixth attempt of sleeping, I had the shortest dream anyone could ever have. I went downstairs to relax myself, and I saw, or I guess felt, the presence of my mom, because I didn't really see her in the dream, but I knew in the dream that I was caught downstairs drinking some water. On the seventh, which was my last attempt, before staying up the whole night, was my worst one. After the dream on my sixth attempt, I immediately heard footsteps charging to my door. I initially thought it was my mom going to my sister's room, but no. My door was opened, and I felt the presence of someone or something in my room for eight to ten seconds. 
When I tried to move, it was the hardest attempt to move yet. After getting consciousness, I headed to my parents' room and found that they were both asleep, which creeped me the fuck out because who opened the door? Who was banging and knocking? And who was making those footsteps and mumbling in the background? Those were my thoughts before I confronted my parents about what had happened. They comforted me, and they claimed it was just sleep paralysis, when it wasn't. I just headed back to my room and wrote my experience of what happened. Here is what I think caused all of this. Two days ago, I suddenly started fasting because I wanted to be cut. Eight hours before this experience, I took a nap for four hours and woke up at ten. But still, how does any of this cause my hallucinations and effects? I'm so confused and scared. Has anyone else been in this situation before? This is an account of some events that happened to me two years ago in New Orleans. I haven't spoken about this to anyone. Like me, my friends and family are not believers in the paranormal. I just don't have any explanation for what happened to me. A few years ago, I took a series of jobs in hospitality as a way to travel to different parts of the USA. In 2022, I took a position at a small hostel in New Orleans. The hostel is a beautiful Victorian house just on the edge of the French Quarter, and I was really excited about using it as my base to explore the city and the state of Louisiana. Like most old houses, the building had some quirks. You know how wood settles in old homes? Sometimes it would sound like there were footsteps upstairs. Guests in room three would always come down to reception to check if there was a problem with the air conditioning. That room was always cold. I remember the Yale lock on the front door would start whirring for no reason, despite changing the batteries and the lock itself. It was a few weeks into my stay there that things began to get strange. It started with a candlestick. It was autumn, and since the peak season was now done, we decided to deep clean the house, including the top floor, which is not open to guests. I remember reaching up to dust the top of a bookshelf when my hand hit something. There was a sudden crash that made me freak out that I'd broken something. I'd knocked something heavy-sounding off the top of the bookshelf, and it had fallen, luckily into an open cardboard box instead of denting the wooden floors. I looked at it, turning it around in my hand. It was covered in cobwebs and what looked like rust, but I could see that underneath all that was a beautiful, ornate candlestick. I put my hand up on top of the bookshelf again, feeling around for its pair, but... I couldn't find it there, or anywhere else around the room. I'm pretty sure I went to look for the other staff right then, wanting to show them this beautiful candlestick, and to ask if they'd seen the other one. I thought it would be good to put them out on display. The first person I came across was a girl. I'll call her Megan. I showed it to her excitedly, asking if she'd seen the other one but she just raised her eyebrows and said it was creepy and to chuck it out. I argued that it just needed cleaning up, and I ended up taking it to the bathroom, washing off all the cobwebs and the rusty stuff, which luckily washed off without any difficulty. I never didn't find the other one, but I found a candle for it and put it on display on the dining room table. Around this time, I started sleeping badly. It wasn't nightmares, exactly. I just never woke up feeling rested. It was like the feeling you get right when you wake up, just after your dog dies or you've got your heart broken. It's a feeling of dread sinking into your stomach, just for a second, knowing something is wrong, waiting for the memory to hit again. But it never did, and I never knew why I felt that way. It was just something I went through every morning. 
I don't remember now if it was the next morning or a few days later, but I went to put out breakfast and the candlestick wasn't on the table anymore. I didn't think anything of it. People get drunk on Bourbon Street. They come back late and do weird things. I found it under the table and put it back where it was. The next day, though, it had moved again, and this time I found it on the other side of the room. And strangely, the rusty substance was there again, creeping slowly back up the base of the candlestick. A few days later, it had moved again, and I had to spend a good amount of time searching for it. I was already in a bad mood that morning because of something that had happened the night before. I had wanted to go and see a friend's jazz band that evening and ask if someone would switch shifts with me. I had switched shifts as a favor to them more times than I could count. Most people like to go out in the evening in New Orleans to enjoy the nightlife, but I was studying on the side, enjoyed the quieter nighttime shifts where I could sometimes read a little and would often stay at the desk after the end of my shift to study in the peace and quiet. But I didn't understand why it was that one time I asked to go out in the evening, and everyone avoided my eyes and just shuffled awkwardly. Why were they so selfish when I asked them to switch with me? After what happened to me later, I have an idea why they didn't want to be alone there after dark. Anyway... On this morning, I was looking for the candlestick. I didn't blame partygoers anymore and had a good idea who kept moving it. A few nights ago, I'd come up from the evening shift to the kitchen. It was dark, all the lights were off, and I'd come into the dining room. I'd glimpsed Megan standing there looking at it. Even though I only saw her from behind, I knew it was her. She was the only girl here with long, dark hair and she'd said the candlestick was creepy the first time she'd seen it. I found it again, this time shoved in the bottom of the storage closet, and when I saw Megan, I confronted her, telling her to stop moving the candlestick. She said she didn't. I was holding it in my hand and felt this consuming rage flow through me. Honestly, a kind of anger way out of proportion to what was happening. It was just for a second, and I came to my senses. She was looking at me with wide eyes. I put the candlestick back on the table. After that, I kept seeing the candlestick in the dining room, and I felt a little embarrassed about almost losing my temper with Megan. I didn't know why she lied about moving it, but I pride myself on being professional, and I didn't feel good about what had happened. I felt guilty every time I looked at it. One day, while cleaning, I randomly moved it into room four, where I wouldn't walk past it several times a day. I didn't plan on keeping it there, but that room wasn't going to be occupied for a few days. A little while after this, something else happened. One night, I'd finished the evening shift and began studying at the front desk. It was just after 1 a.m. when I heard footsteps in the corridor behind me. I recognized the woman who came into the lobby. She was staying upstairs in one of the dormitories. Due to a missed flight, a party of four people who were due to stay in that dormitory had not arrived. They had phoned earlier, telling me they had decided to stay in Fort Lauderdale another week and wanted to reschedule their whole stay. So, this lady was staying alone in what I think was a five-bed dormitory. When I saw her, her hair was messed up and she looked really tired, so I was immediately concerned. I think I asked her if everything was all right, and she asked me if I could check on the person in the room next to hers, because it seemed like they had been crying for hours. She hadn't been able to sleep because of the noise and was pretty worried that the person in there was not doing okay. So I followed her upstairs to knock on the door where she heard the crying, taking the keys with me in case I needed to let myself into the room. Next to hers was one of the dormitories. It had eight or so beds, but tonight there were only a couple of girls staying there. I stopped outside and raised my hand to knock on the door when she stopped me. She said the crying had been coming from the room 
opposite her. Room 4. Now, I had assumed she meant the dormitory, because that room was occupied. Room 4 was not. I told her this, but she seemed certain that the crying had been coming from that room. Right then, there was nothing other than silence and the creaking of an old house. I tried to reassure her that the noise she heard was probably one of the hostel's cats or another animal. I've heard that there's a kind of swamp rat in Louisiana that can sound like a baby crying, and I've heard foxes in the woods before that they sound like a woman being murdered. I'm no stranger to the unsettling sounds wild animals can make, but to put her mind at ease, I decided to check room four. I opened the door and switched on the light. No one was there. I gave her my reassurances, and she went back to her room. Something else had caught my eye, though. The lampshade on the far side of the bed was torn, and something was on the pillow. I walked around the bed, and I saw what had happened. On the pillow were some small shards of broken glass, and on the floor was the candlestick. It was as if it had been thrown across the room at the lamp, torn through the fabric of the lampshade, and smashed the light bulb. Something I probably should have mentioned. Megan had returned to her home county before I took the candlestick into this room. I had a bad feeling right then that it had never been her moving it. I didn't see much of that woman over the next couple of days. Up until one morning... I was working reception. I heard the sound of suitcase wheels and quick footsteps coming down the tile corridor. It was her, the woman who had heard the crying, saying she wanted to check out. She still had three nights left on the reservation, so I asked lightly if there had been a change of plan. She just shook her head, and when I looked at her face, she looked pale with dark circles under her eyes as if she hadn't slept. I tried asking if there was a problem with the room or anything we could do to help her enjoy her stay, but she shoved the keys at me and was gone. Once she left, I went up to her room. I wondered what had made her act so weird. I checked all over that room, but I never found out. A few days later, room four was booked, and I meant to take the candlestick back to the dining room. Instead, I put it in a cleaning caddy and forgot about it, and it made its way downstairs with me. Rather than take it back upstairs, I decided to take it to my room and return it to its spot tomorrow. Something happened that that night almost made me leave the hostel. Even writing about it now makes me feel very uncomfortable. I woke up that night to the sounds of someone moving around my room. I was still half asleep and thought I was dreaming, but in a way I cannot describe. I knew somehow that those noises weren't coming from inside my mind. They were coming from somewhere in the room. I heard footsteps rustling, and then finally, the feeling of someone or something sitting down on the bed. I remember the weight of it, the way it depressed the mattress, and somehow I just knew that whatever it was, was not human. I kept as still as I could, but my heart was beating so hard I was sure that whatever it was would be able to hear it. It seemed to sit there for a long time while I lay there, too afraid to move. My every nerve attuned to it. After a time, I felt the bed move again, and it was gone. I never heard the door open or close. I remember lying there for a long time, the covers pulled up over my head, hearing my heart beating against the mattress, sounding like footsteps, too terrified to move. It was after this I started looking into leaving New Orleans. I slept with the lights on and only a kind of twitching, nervous half-sleep at that. My heart was always beating too fast and too hard in my chest. The lack of sleep wasn't helping. I knew, but I was afraid of sleep. I felt constantly like there was someone behind me. I kept imagining footsteps coming down the corridor. One morning, 
Another staff member went to start their shift and the keys were gone. This irritated me because there were three sets of keys when I'd finished my shift that night before. I can't explain why this angered me as much as it did. I'm not usually quick to anger, but I just felt that rage building inside me again and a sense of being so deeply wronged. Looking back, I'm pretty sure no one made any accusations against me or anyone else, but I just felt everyone was accusing me of having lost them because I was on shift the previous night. I started demanding to view the cameras to see who had taken the keys. I think everyone just wanted to calm me down. So, the manager went and got the laptop and brought up the video feed. We found last night's footage. There was me, getting everything done, three sets of keys hanging up, me turning off the light and leaving. We started skipping through the footage until we saw the door open again. 1.33 a.m. That's when I saw the worst thing I had ever seen. Myself. I saw myself enter the lobby, take the key off the wall, and head down the corridor. There's a sick horror I can't describe in seeing yourself doing something you have no memory of doing. Realizing your own body isn't something you're in control of. I think I apologized. I really hope I did. I left the same day. I'd never slept walked before, and I have no explanation for what happened. Thankfully, since I left, I haven't had anything weird happen. I've been able to move on with my life and think about it less and less. But sometimes, I can still see that video in my mind's eye. And the feeling sensation of the mattress sinking as whatever it was sat watching me. New Orleans is amazing and the house was beautiful, but whatever happened to me was the most terrifying experience of my entire life. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go on, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Mrs. Innerscare, Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Chrissy Elias, Anita B., Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Buzz Crispin, Patty Sneeze, Denise Des, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for being such a pillar of support for Back to Ashes. I really do appreciate you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourself. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all. <laughs>